Hi, welcome to the second part of inference for distributions of categorical data. We're talking about our two weight tables and our chi-square statistic. All right, so let's jump on in. The relationship between those categorical variables, uh, remember our categorical variables are, um, you know, defining a population based off of what they are. You know, I can define a population based off of age group, gender, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, when we have a two-way table with a single random sample chosen from a single population and then classified as two distinct categorical variables, our goal at that point is to analyze the relationship between the variables. So if that is the goal to, relate, to analyze the relationship between them, is there a, you know, like, uh, what were we talking about? The um, what was it, the Italian music, the French music, and, and all of that versus, you know, if, if our secondary question had been to an, analyze the relationship between them, is there a relationship, then we would use this test of independence. So here is a uh, stem sentence for our null and alternative hypothesis. You can read them for yourself. We will use them in just a moment. Our um, conditions for being met are the exact same except with random. Obviously, because we're doing a test for independence, you're using data from a single sample. In our previous video, when we did a test for homogeneity, the word I can't say, homogeneity, um, you would have data from two or more actual samples or groups. So that's the big difference here is that with independence, you have a single population that we've categorized ourselves and homogeneity, you have more than one sample or more than one. Um, go back. So this is just a little uh, sort of an idea about a state plan do conclude. So you can read it up here. And then I've given you a nice little compare and contrast between goodness and fit, homogeneity, and association or independence. So here's our three different types of chi-squares. You can look through them, the different types of hypotheses, assumptions, and tests we would do. Um, if you need further than that, as we go through, I might be able to give you some uh, ideas about knowing which one to use. So how do I use the right type of chi-square test? So let's look at this example. Are men and women equally likely to suffer lingering fear from watching scary movies as children? So we're comparing and contrasting men and women's fear levels when they watch scary movies as children. So researchers asked a random sample, a single random sample of 117 college students to write narrative accounts of their exposure to scary movies before the age of 13. About a fourth of the students or more than a fourth of the students said that some of the fright symptoms are still present when they're awake. And the following table breaks down these results by gender. So if you look at the fright symptoms of males versus females, yes versus no, et cetera, et cetera. So we have that two-way table. And who uh, categorized the males and females? We did. We broke those categories down. Those 117 still come from the same single random pop. So how do I know which to use? Here's the mini tab output. We will reference back to this a couple of times. It will show back up, but if you need to, you can take a snipping of it. Um, so our first question is, which chi-square test are we going to use? Well, they don't even talk about goodness of fit, and why is that? Well, a goodness of fit allows us to test whether a certain population distribution seems valid. Basically, you have one variable and one sample test to deal with. So did we try to say the question, do the data match the model? Well, did we have a model about fear factors versus gender? No. So it's not really a goodness of fit test. We're not comparing this back to a distribution we know, like the M&M's question. Um, so we do know that we're in, because it's a two-way table also, we know we're not dealing with goodness of fit. So let's jump down into our other two chi's homogeneity and independence. So how do I know that this question is an independence besides it being in the video about independence and uh, uh, telling it to us? How did I know we don't use that chi-square for homogeneity? Well, I've got two little sentences to read out to you and then we can further talk about it. The data were produced using a single random sample, so more likely independence, and then they were classified into those two categories by gender on whether or not they had lingering fright symptoms. So again, we're talking about independence there because we've got a single population that we're categorizing. The chi-square test for homogeneity requires independent random samples from every population. So I would have had to have pulled a random sample of women and a random sample of men to do the chi-square test for homogeneity. Um, how else can I say that? Chi-square versus test of independence. Maybe test of independence is, um, Two variables, one population. Test for homogeneity is one variable, multiple pops. Um, 
the test for homogeneity, you might ask the question, is the variable similar across the populations? Whereas test for independence, we might ask the question, are the two variables independent or not? So in this instance, are the male and female uh, independent of each other or do, is there, a, is there a, um, a tie in for fear factor from male and female? So again, we're talking about the, co the comparison of those two male and female. So we're definitely talking about independence, that association between them. So let's go ahead and state our appropriate pair of hypotheses. So if we wanted to, we could go back all the way back to this um, table of the differences between them. And you can look at the hypothesis that I've got going on up here or really not the, hypo the stem sentences for our hypotheses. So when we deal with independence or association, we have the stem sentence. There is no association between the two variables in context, or there is some association between the two variables in context. So let's go ahead and write those two sentences in context. So our null hypothesis would be there is no association between gender and ongoing fright symptoms. So there's our two variables in context in the population of college students. So again, I've given you all of the context, not just there is no association, that wouldn't be enough. Alternate hypothesis, there is an association between gender and ongoing fright symptoms in the population of college students. Again, I am BSing, I am being specific. And question C wants us to read this mini tab output. Um, so assuming the conditions are met, which cell contributes most to the chi-squared statistic? So if I look through this mini tab, here's our uh, observed count. This is our expected count. And this is the chi statistic of that particular cell. This is the chi-square statistic of the entire two-way table. So let's look at those four chi's, 1.8, 0.90, 0.83, and 0.4, which is the biggest one. Which one contributes most to our chi-square? So the men who admitted to having lingering symptoms account for the largest component of the chi-square statistic, 1.883, of the total 4.028. It's a pretty big chi-square statistic according, uh, uh, compared to the other three chi-square statistics. So our second question is, in what way does this cell differ from the null hypothesis suggestion? So far fewer men in the sample admitted to fright symptoms, seven, than we would have expected were to be true. And how do we have that? We have that expected count we calculated, 11.69. So we were expecting a lot more men to admit to fright symptoms than actually occurred. So our chi-square is very large. Our, um, our, uh, our observed counts are a lot further away than the expected counts for this than compared to females saying yes, males saying no, and females saying no. Okay. Assuming that conditions were met, then let's finish the question. Let's do our conclusion. Let's interpret that p-value first and foremost. What does it mean when our p-value is 0.045 when we're dealing with a chi-square test for independence? Well, in context, it means if gender and ongoing fright symptoms really are independent of the population of interest, then there is a 0.045 chance or a point, uh, sorry, or a 4.5% chance of obtaining a random sample of 117 students that gives a chi-square statistic of 4.028 or higher. So remember, p-value just by itself, the only context this has is back to the given information. That's it, that's the only context it can have is talking about the population, the variables, um, and the, uh, the chi-square statistic itself. We can't talk about, we can't infer anything outside of that. But if we compare our p-value, we can draw a conclusion back to our alpha. So if we have a conclusion of, or sorry, our alpha value is 0.01, so 1% or 99% confidence interval, then because our p-value, 0.045, is greater than our alpha value, 0.01, we would fail to reject. So don't please don't say we can't reject, just say we would fail to reject the null. We do not have convincing evidence that there is an association between gender and fright symptoms in the population of college students. I want you to see how many things are part of that concluding sentences, because as I did some of y'all's feedback and grading, I noticed that some of you just put, we failed to reject or we reject the null. That's all you put. You have to give me more than that. You have to show me the comparison of P to alpha. And then you have to tell me whether you reject it or fail to reject. And then you have to give it to me in context. We do or do not have convincing evidence. Blah, 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 blah. All righty. And that's all I've got for you for this. And I'll see you in chapter 12. And I'll see you online.